bit on that what wounds us can also indicate what helps and heals us. You see, Uranus ultimately is like a blueprint. It's like an invisible, subtle matrix. There's a biologist in the UK called Rupert Sheldrake who talks about morphogenetic fields, invisible shapes that plants grow to. In a way, the subtle mental aspect that is Uranus that we're talking about operates like that. A shape, a butterfly effect, a shape inside us, a subtle pattern to our consciousness that as we awaken to it can help us grow. Trauma is just one expression of what we remember. There is also a life meaning blueprint. When we talk about the phrase individuation, technically it comes from Jungian psychology, from the ideas of Carl Jung. And he saw it quite poetically as a journey initially to encounter shadow, Saturn, that which we suppress. And then we integrate the anima and the animus, the hidden other inside us. And then we're open to the wise being, the self, or the old wise teacher figure that comes in our consciousness. So that's how Jung kind of visualized that process on one level, a sort of never-ending journey into the unique being that we all are. So in a sense, when we identify trauma, what we're looking to do is liberate the person. The wound can also be what heals. So just to recap some of the charts we've looked at, just from memory, there was the young lady who had struggled with uh, bulimia, who had Uranus and Scorpio in the first house. As we were occupying a bridging period before she found a therapist to work with in the area where she studied, she found it helpful, after we talked about this, to go and sit in the sauna for a very long time, concentrating, committed on reconnecting to her body. And after she'd done this for a long while, she would often break down and cry. And she would feel a real sense of release through her body, a warming. So Uranus in the first house, in Scorpio, you know, troubled memories, complex sexual feelings, abusive dynamics in the past. And yet, she can find inspiration in acknowledging her instinctual body and the right safe environment for herself, making that commitment to herself. And then the very same feelings can begin to liberate and change. Remember the chart of the person who, Uranus in second house in Libra, who'd had the lifetime where in killing the Cathar priest, he'd realized this person was more truly like him than what he was doing in the world. And he'd had the Egyptian lifetime where he'd done the opposite thing, where he'd been punished for standing by someone or standing by the truth. He has this awakening, doesn't he then, to his inherent values or service for others. He sees a radical equality. Someone picked up on it, how it triggers through time, those two events. And this is another observation, by the way. Let's not get too literal about past lives. We don't know entirely how they work. Time is not just a simple linear event. It appears to the ego like a simple linear event. History looks like something with a beginning, middle, and end to the ego. But it may not be as simple as that. There's a number of levels to which this is useful because you may talk to people or be working with people who don't believe in past lives. I often find then that using the idea of the Jungian collective unconscious and the many archetypes therein and soul dramas and stories that we can relate to in that level of consciousness can help bridge the idea for them. We don't have to take this literally. I do personally believe that it's quite a sensible sounding story that we come here many times to learn how to become more progressively loving and wise. That makes sense to me. But it's not a fashionable view in our world. And this doesn't mean that you have to, with people who don't take that viewpoint, 
hold off on these techniques. There are ways of reaching people. As we're going to see in a moment, when we catch up with the chart we were looking at yesterday, sometimes as well, regardless of the person's belief, they go into experiences anyway. But you remember the lady with Uranus in Gemini, in the third, the conversation at the conference. She had the, it was the chart we looked at on day one, all the Pluto stuff in Leo in the fifth as a skip step. And I spoke to her about how, well, had she felt unseen in other parts of her life. See, it's an inspirational dialogue for her, isn't it? Uranus, Gemini, third. The very thing that hurt her, asking a question and feeling not listened to, Uranus, Gemini, third, becomes the source of a conversation that's inspirational to her, that makes her feel recognized for how she wasn't seen. She cries, she releases, and she spends the rest of the day in bed and feels better afterwards, and to the level that her husband wants to come out on the last night of the conference to say a special thank you to me. For a two and a half minute conversation at the edges of a conference room. The very thing that hurt her, Uranus Gemini third, is the thing that inspired her if it was stayed with in the fullness of what it could be. We remember the story of the young man who was told he was evil. Pluto, Uranus, trauma signature with Mercury retrograde, ruling the south node in Virgo, all in, <coughs> excuse me, all in the fourth house. You see, when we worked together for a while and he realized this man he'd known in his life, this sort of bitter man who had messed about with these dark magics and stuff, when he realized in himself that that did not mean that he was damned, basically, and you see the sensitivity to being damned. The family tells you you're evil. The family has a belief system that you have a type of sin that will see you suffer down there simply for the way you feel about people. His sensitivity to it's extraordinary. When he realized it wasn't true, the liberation was enormous. He emotionally felt much better in himself. He felt so much better, it was a, it was a palpable difference to behold. Sadly, pertaining to the long-term fracturing, when he feels really good about himself, the tendency to, for the mania comes in. And that's when he becomes a loose cannon because he's feeling good about himself. We see the guy, Uranus in Sagittarius in the fifth house, who when his career was going badly, when it was on stall, when he, he believed inside it should be going better. Uranus fifth trauma, I'm not being recognized for my creative genius. It's not going the way it should be, the way I want it to be. He acted out in his life. Drink, drugs, ch police chases. When it's reframed for him and his creativity is acknowledged and someone that he's beginning to trust, like my good self, puts it on the line for him and says, well, are you going to commit to this or what? Or just mess about and get yourself in trouble? He does it. He takes it to a level. The creativity inspires him. When it's channeled like that, it's not traumatic. I'm just wanting to put this, I'm aware we've spoken about difficult and heavy subjects for a number of days. We're right in the heart of a long, very deep conference space. There's been a lot of astrology. And I've, led, I've been leading us on a fairly strange journey with people's difficult material. But it also includes the seeds of liberation and healing. The Uranus in Virgo, the example we're looking at here the crossover between Virgo to Libra. Well, we'll talk about that when we've looked at this chart a bit more. But in essence, you see, what was persecution, what was negative thinking, becomes an active inspiration to inspire and serve, to be useful. 